Hey everyone, Philip here, and this is Brainstorm. Let's start with a little experiment. I want you to look at this picture of a face and tell me what emotion you're seeing. If you're curious what other people are thinking, click up here, choose one of the answers in the poll and you will see other people's responses. When I first saw this image, I had to think of intense fear and terror. But what happens if we add some much needed context to this image? Ah, that changes the game completely, right? All of a sudden, it's not fear and terror, but it's joy and excitement and exaltation and happiness. How could this be? Let's go on a scientific journey and dive deep into the new science of emotions and feelings. Let's go. The Iliad. But I don't want to talk about the Iliad, despite it being one of my favorite texts of all time. Instead, I want you to look at the sky. What color is it? Probably blue, right? The problem is, in none of the over 1300 pages of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined, does Homer ever mention the color blue. Gladstone writes, Lastly, let us take the case of the sky or the heavens. Here Homer had before him the most perfect example of blue. Yet he never once so describes the sky. His ovapos is starry, or broad, or great, or iron or copper, but it is never blue. There even is an Israeli linguist, Guy Deutscher, who thinks that the ancient Greeks didn't see the sky as blue because they didn't have a word for it. In other words, they didn't have a concept for the color blue. Concepts define our world. This is the message here. If we look at a rainbow, we kind of picture it like this. But of course, in reality, there are not six distinct colors in a rainbow. It's just a difference in wavelength of the light reflecting from the water droplets. And frequencies are sitting on a gradual spectrum, not distinct color buckets. Let's look at this picture. What do you see? No, this is not a Rorschach test. If you've never seen this image before, you probably only see some black blobs. Meaning your brain is throwing a million prediction at this image to figure out what this could be. If none of the predictions fit, you're in a state of experiential blindness, not knowing what you're looking at. But what if I told you I can make your brain see an animal here by the power of concepts? Let's have a look. If you now go back to the first image, what do you see? You see the bee. You still see the bee. Even though the picture didn't change, the lines didn't change, but your brain predicted the bee. It had the concept of the bee in it, filling out the gaps between the black blobs. As we can see by the example of the colors and the bee, we construct the world around us by the concepts we have learned. I want to tell you the story of a patient called SM46. Patient SM had a very rare genetic disease where both of her amygdalas, amygdala, amygdalas calcified meaning the brain tissue, the neural tissue in amygdalas was completely destroyed, leading to the fear centers of her brain being completely destroyed as well. She has been studied for decades by famous psychologists of the University of Iowa, and they took her to haunted houses and showed her scary movies like Psycho and Shining, and showed her facial expressions like fear. She never reported or showed any signs of fear or distress in all those years. If we would truly assume the amygdala to be the fear center of the brain, there should be no way under any circumstances that patient SM ever experiences fear or distress. And the classic case study seems to confirm that. But a few years ago, the researchers found an unexpected exception to that rule. When she was exposed to air with a higher CO2 concentration, she could experience intense fear and even panic and terror. Wouldn't we expect her to never, under any circumstances, experience fear and distress if the amygdala is truly necessary for fear? We saw in the beginning of this video that someone's facial expressions are not the clearest marker of someone's internal emotional state as we assume them to be. There have been now newer studies done of the original studies by Ekman. In the original studies by Ekman, people got a face, 
with answer options, with emotion words on the side they could choose the correct answer from. In the newer studies, they left those emotion words out and just presented the participants with the emotional faces. The correct answer dropped significantly. But if faces truly mirror someone's emo internal emotional state, wouldn't we expect the results to be pretty much similar and replicate Ekman's original findings? We seem to be losing scientific ground here. But what about the clear-cut physiologic responses and emotions? It's like heart rate and sweating. We call it autonomic nervous system response. In a meta-analysis by Kachop et al, they found that the variance between people, so the difference between people in their physiological responses was so large that it was impossible for them to identify one specific emotion just by looking at the physiological responses. There have been three more meta-analyses since then, and none of them found physiological responses to be either specific or reliable enough to identify one emotion just by looking at them. So if brain regions are not clearly connected to one emotion, and facial expressions are not a clear identification of internal states of people's emotion, and now we're losing physiological responses as well, what does that tell us about our classical theory of emotion? Could it be that our old theories about emotions are inadequate or even completely inaccurate? Imagine you're walking through a dense forest. The air is cold and crisp. You're enjoying the solitude and quietness that is surrounding you. All of a sudden, you see something from the periphery of your eye, a huge spider right next to you in the forest. How do you react? What emotion will you feel? According to the classic theory of emotions, this is what happens inside your body. Your brain registers a stimulus or a trigger that seems to be activating your fear response, your fear centers in your brain. We talked about this before, this is in the amygdala. And that fear response in the amygdala leads immediately also to that feeling of panic. There's a second classic theory of emotions, which is called the James Langer theory of emotions which switches the things around a little bit. It begins again with a stimulus, in this case, the spider in the forest. You see the spider, but instead of immediately activating your fear centers of the brain, the spider stimulus automatically leads to a physiological reaction in your body, makes your heart rate go up, makes you sweat a little bit, which then in turn, in the brain, leads to a feeling of fear. But what if you're like me, a biologist, and you come across the exact same spider in the forest? You might even have the same physiological response. Your heart rate goes up a little bit. You might be even starting to sweat. But what if you have a completely different emotional experience? Instead of fear, you might be feeling joy or excitement for having found such an amazing spider in the forest. So with the exact same stimulus and the exact same physiological response, you might have completely different emotional reactions to a spider just because of your past experiences and how that shaped your concept. Either spiders are freaking dangerous or spiders are freaking cool. And this concept is then communicated back to all the other regions and the sensory input of the spider in combination with your physiological changes, in combination with that concept that has been shaped by your past experiences are all put together to predict the appropriate emotional response and then you either land on the concept of fear or you land on the concept of excitement because you see a cool spider. And that's how emotions are made. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. This video series on emotion has been inspired and kicked off by a book I've been reading by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Oh shit. I highly recommend you read this book if you want to support the channel, you can buy it via the Amazon link in the description below. But honestly, I don't care where you get your copy. Just grab one and start reading. This book is seriously good. If you like this video and you feel the right emotions about it, you can click here. I always forget where it was. Is it here? I'm thinking about doing the next video on depression. I've been reading a great book about it. Stay tuned. That was a good take. That was a great take. Take some B-roll while we're here. But what happens if we add some much needed context to this image? Stop honking. The same physiological response could lead to an entirely different emotion depending on your, oh fuck, ah.